John Ridley, Vita Ayala, and Paula Sevenbergen return to conclude their fantastic Batman-centric stories as Tim Fox runs a gauntlet of magistrate soldiers to make sure justice is served, Cassandra Kane and the Resistance orchestrate a prison break, and Catwoman and Poison Ivy escape the magistrate's iron grip once again with the help of the android DD Prime. John Ridley finishes up his Tim Fox Batman story for now, leaving it with a great conclusion that still leaves some questions to be answered in his follow-up book Second Son, which will no doubt go into more detail regarding the Fox family drama which was hinted at throughout this series. I did enjoy the brief moment Tim had with his mother when he confronted her as Batman, although I feel like maybe they should have expanded on that a little more. Then again it was in the middle of a chaos field battle. I think just maybe they should have just had one scene in there with Tanya talking to Tim as Batman and it would have made her maybe change her mind regarding the shoot on site bill she's working towards. I think it would have been interesting to see that dynamic. I did really enjoy that Tim's Batman does anything and everything to make sure justice is served correctly. In this case combating the magistrate to make sure two killers are given fair treatment and a fair trial. It's again something else that sets him apart from previous Batman who just leave the villains tied up for GCPD to deal with. Vita Ayala concluded her pretty much perfect Batgirl storyline in a hopeful way, tying it up to the other books like Catwoman, Nightwing, and even Dark Detective. Cassandra being the star of the book was a real highlight for the story and I enjoyed it exploring her broken relationship with Stephanie and the rest of the Bat family, especially in the wake of her and Stephanie becoming Batgirls again and growing closer together after Joker War and them going in opposite directions, but in directions they wouldn't usually go, which was really great to see, like Cass becoming a real team player for the resistance while Steph became a more violent loner. It was a nice bit of role reversal. Paula Sevenbergen finished up her really fun girls night out adventure story that took a bit more of a serious turn in this final part. There was still lots of fun comedy to be had coming from the trio basically hiding out and having a spa day but also dealing with serious things like abuse and it did so in some surprisingly fucked up ways thanks to Dee Dee revealing she was basically an imprisoned teenage girl who may or may not have been a rich white billionaire's real doll. I really commend the issue for going there and dealing with subjects like abuse and how these women all come together through their shared pain and rise above it. The artwork for the book was all top notch, beginning with Laura Braga's great work on Next Batman. I love the way she draws action, especially over the last two issues which both featured some high speed chases in one way or another, and it put Batman in situations we rarely see him in, like driving a normal car, which is pretty awesome and a little bit hilarious as well. Anake finished up Batgirl's story with some really fun two page spreads detailing the prison riot, filling out the pages with all sorts of heroes and villains. There was even a fantastic blue print style page as Cassandra is making her way through the prison which looked fantastic. Emanuela Lupacino rounded out the amazing artwork again with some lovely looking pages that again much like the previous part of the story was quite a fashion show for these characters. All who had some fantastic new costumes on every other page and updates to their old costumes as well. The story didn't have all that much action in it but Emanuela made a bunch of characters just sitting around and talking so much fun to look at. Future State, the next Batman issue 4, drew Batman's time in Future State to a close, for now at least, in some interesting ways that, that left the door open for stories to continue through Infinite Frontier. The backup stories concluded their respective storylines really well and dealt with some really heavy themes of abuse and broken families, something which they probably didn't need to, but I'm really glad they did. I'm really looking forward to Tim Fox's story continuing soon and what John Ridley has in store for us, since I think it's going to be a doozy. I'm going to give this issue a 9 out of 10. Future State, the next Batman issue 4, finds Eric choking Batman with a rope. Batman manages to stab the man with his gauntlets, kicking him off and demanding he put the bat he grabs down. His wife pleads with him to stop, so he does, dropping the bat. Batman says that they don't care about justice and are just trying to get away with murder, but Eric says that he's trying to help Sarah get away, since Jacefsky was killed by him and it was his idea. Sarah tries to explain that's not true and that she wanted the man who killed their daughter dead as well, but Eric wants 
Batman to tell the police that he alone killed the man. Batman doesn't care what they want since they are both going in and if they attack again, he's going to leave them for the peacekeepers. Sarah asks what the plan is but Batman has no plan, stealing a vehicle to keep ahead of the peacekeepers and try to make it the 32 blocks to City Hall. Batman gives the couple each a microcharge since it might buy them some time in a tight spot, explaining how to use it, despite not trusting Eric all that much. Speeding away in their car, the trio are soon besieged by the magistrate, who open fire on them. Batman hits the brakes, causing one of the bikers behind them to flip over the car, but the others keep coming, blasting the car with their machine guns. Batman gives the couple some discs, telling them to throw them at the bikes, and doing so, the discs magnetize to the sides of them, exploding in an EMP wave that destroys the bikes. The couple note how there are no drones coming after them, and Batman knows whomever is in charge wants them to be killed by a human and not leave it up to a machine, which means now that Batman knows that, he needs to hold back. Eric says that the men are trying to kill them, but Batman tells him that he doesn't get to tell him how it's done. The magistrate return in armored trucks, ramming the small SUV as Batman knows they are only 13 blocks away, but they won't make it. Eric reminds Batman what he told him, that it was him, not Sarah, who wanted the man dead. He jumps from the car, falling into the road, and as the magistrate trucks bear down on him, he detonates the charge, blowing the truck up. Batman swerves from the explosion into the path of a pedestrian, making him relive a similar incident in his past, but he manages to swerve at the last minute, smashing into a group of cars. One of the cars belonged to Tanya Fox, who gets out and pulls a gun on Batman. Tim knows that she's blind with rage and doesn't care who she shoots at, be it him or Sarah, so he's got no choice, flinging a batarang and hitting her in the shoulder, disarming her. The magistrate captain soon confronts Batman, finding the hero doesn't care about the innocent civilians and the hero wonders why people want him dead. Batman and the captain viciously fight one another until Batman stabs him in the chest, knocking him away. Batman continues to beat the injured man over and over until Sarah tells him he's had enough. Batman stops, knowing he definitely hasn't had enough, but still leaves with Sarah. At City Hall, Chubbs and Tells wait around for Batman, but his one hour window has expired. Tells asks his partner if it's good to do Batman a solid since he didn't do one for her ex-partner. Chubbs knows what happened to Whitaker shouldn't have happened to anyone, but it wasn't Batman's fault. The hero soon arrives with Sarah, telling the officers that the other perp he had was killed, informing them that Jeffsevsky murdered their little girl. Chubbs didn't think they would survive the night, asking if Batman's suit is bulletproof. As Tim explains that it mostly is, Chubbs shoots him in the chest, saying when Montoya asks her, she can say that she did her job and shot Batman on sight. As the hero gets up, she tells Batman in the future to go easy with her phone number as later, Tim meets with his family at the hospital, but Luke isn't happy he is there and that he disappeared on them, asking if it was drugs or alcohol this time. Tim says he's there for their mother, not Luke's crap, but Luke continues shoveling it onto the man, saying that if he's got it all wrong, then Tim can just speak up and say something. The man doesn't, however, saying his business is his alone. Lucius tells Jace to go see his mother, but Luke can't understand why they coddle him by calling him that, since he's always gotten everything he wanted and it needs to end, and until he sorts himself out, Tim needs to go. Tam thinks the foxes need to stick together as Tim goes to visit his mother, who says Batman did this to her and he tried to kill her. But Tim says that Batman is good at what he does, and maybe he was just trying to disarm her. Tanya says that she'll tell him what she told his sister. People who do the right thing don't need to wear masks, ever. So Batman is dangerous and he needs to be stopped. Tim tells her to worry about that later, since right now he wants his mother to get better and worry about being a family again. In the magistrate detention facility, Cassandra Kane uses her subdermal cybernetics to hack into the security panel as the lockdown protocols are activated across the prison. In the mess hall, the prisoners, led by Stephanie Brown, cause a riot, attacking the guards who try and subdue them with their bracelet restraints. Cassandra, meanwhile, makes her move, taking down a guard and taking his uniform, moving through the facility, telling one of the men he is needed in the mess hall on the captain's orders, clearing out the room. Captain Anderson, meanwhile, finishes up in the mess hall, having subdued all the inmates. He kicked Stephanie in the face, saying that the only tried and true method to deal with animals is to first show them freedom and then yank it away. 
Cassandra tells Steph not to give up as her and her inmates' restraints are deactivated. Steph says that she guesses the animals got loose as the riot begins back up again. Steph says that the captain's comms will be down for 10 minutes while the system reboots, but the captain knows that, that 10 minutes without cameras means he wants his men to take down as many as possible. Steph doesn't know how much longer she can hold out as Jefferson takes down a guard trying to sneak up on her. Steph repays the favor by pushing him out of the way of his taser bolt, but it hits her in the side, causing her to fall unconscious in Jefferson's arms. Cass meanwhile reaches the server room, accessing a security door to find Barbara Gordon strung up inside the mainframe. She quickly detaches her friend, hugging Barbara and telling her that they won't hurt her again. Barbara weakly says that she was connected to the computers and in doing so, she gained access to them as well and had just enough control to send out vague messages to Cassandra. She knows the magistrate is hiding something big and she needs to access the computers. Cass radios Steph, telling her they need to get back to the central command, hoping Batgirl can hold them off for a little longer. There is a gunshot on the comm unit and Steph doesn't answer, so Cass knows this might be the only time they have to get out. Barbara asks if Cass has forgotten so much that she would allow people to become means to an end, but Cass tells her she hasn't. She was just making sure that Barbara hasn't. Cassandra shifts into her Batgirl costume, fighting the oncoming guards that manage to get around her and to Barbara, but the woman easily beats them down despite being weakened reminding Cass that once a Batgirl, always a Batgirl. Getting to the computer, Barbara hacks into the system as Cass contacts Nightwing, telling him that it wasn't Batman they had, it was Oracle. Dick tells her to bring Barbara home as Barbara believes that she has found Batman, who has been leaving a trail behind. Cassandra tells Dick about Steph being there alone with many others. Steph contacts Cassandra, wanting a little help in the mess hall. Barbara asks where she was causing her distraction, hacking the mess hall security as Dick tells Barbara that spoiler new the mission, but Barbara refuses to leave Steph behind. Dick tells her the Resistance has more dire needs right now and they need to get her back more than anything. Cass says that Steph isn't the only one there and there are other heroes and villains in there, all who helped her in her mission, and if they abandon them then she will have failed. Barbara has an idea as Steph and the others are all rounded up. The captain calls the Resistance pathetic as she spits in the man's face, causing the man to slap her, telling the woman that she's going to be plugged into the simulation and once it's done with her, there'll be nothing left of her. Soon an alarm goes off as Steph reminds the captain that the people will never leave each other behind. Oracle appears on the screens and in the holograms around the prison, telling the magistrate that they speak for those that take up arms against tyrants and those that would resist. She reaches out to the people of Gotham, telling them that they put on their masks to fight for them, but lost themselves when they thought that they were better than the people they fought instead of understanding that they were just more fortunate. Oracle knows that, that there is hope, asking the people to join the resistance and they know they have to fight for what is right. Nightwing and the rest of the resistance storm the prison, freeing Steph and the others from the mess hall before detaining the magistrate's guards as Oracle tells the people of Gotham to fight like their lives depended on it and make evil regret being so sure in them. Later at the resistance base, Barbara reunites with Dick, who knows that, that there is much to do, knowing that Bruce is still out there and that he should be looking for him just like he should have been looking for her. Barbara says that he found her when it counted, telling Dick to stop beating himself up over it since he's never been one to let regret stop him from appreciating the good in his life. She kisses Dick, knowing he's right about no time to lose and it's back to work for them, although Dick knows they could maybe spare a few moments. Cassandra meanwhile goes to see Steph, telling her that the villains who helped will be rehabilitated through service to the resistance. Steph asks how Barbara and Dick are going, learning that the lovebirds are nesting. Steph thanks Cass for giving her a chance when she didn't have a reason to, but Cass knows they aren't square just yet, seeing that she was hurt after they decided to take a break from everyone and everything, but so was Steph and she should have seen it for what it was. Steph knows that that's okay and it's a wonder she did see it after everything that has happened. Cassandra stops her, saying that she is sorry for not trusting her since she's always had faith in the cause and she believes in Stephanie Brown, hoping she gives her a chance to prove herself. Cass, however, says she can't forgive Steph's smoking, but the woman knows that that was a bad habit she picked up when she switched sides. Cass reminded her that there is no more sides, hoping that she will quit since she would like her to live long enough to give her an apology. Steph wants to call it even, hugging her friend and toasting to new beginnings and for keeping the faith. 
In Slam Bradley's speakeasy, the Cybers begin shooting the patrons, with Selena hit by one of them. Dee Dee confronts the Cybers who cease fire upon identifying her. She knows they won't fire on a fellow droid, putting herself between the Cyber and Poison Ivy and the others. Pamela gets Selena to the bar, where the injured Slam tells them to push the sign above him and head down the secret passageway. The women do so as Slam tells the girls he's not coming and he'll be fine and all they need to do is take care of Selena. At Magistrate HQ, Dax Dilton watches the Cyber's live feeds of Dee Dee as the arriving Peacekeeper 1 asks if Dee Dee is named after him or if it means domestic droid. Dax says that he made her but she's been corrupted but Peacekeeper knows that the model isn't even for sale yet and they don't even have combat features like she is displaying. Dax is unhappy the feed is cut, wanting to know what happened to Dee Dee and the women that were looking after her but Peacekeeper 1 says he should be more concerned about the Cyber model he made for them since the droid was able to disable it. The the villain wants to know why Dee Dee was hanging out with masks and protecting them but Dax only knows that she's been corrupted. Peacekeeper finds it interesting that he is quick to dismiss the droid but seems so concerned for her. Dax reveals that she was never meant to be out of his reach. Peacekeeper 1 isn't happy the man used their droid tech to make an unauthorized project, not knowing what sick needs Dee Dee fulfilled but he has 24 hours to find them until Simon Saint is brought in to take over. Pamela and the others meanwhile head to one of Ivy's greenhouse hideouts where Ivy uses her vines to pull the bullet from Selena's shoulder. Pamela says that Dee Dee saved Selena since she shut down the cybers with her bare hands. The droid reveals that she reached out through the cybers joints and connected to it and disabled it but that's the only way to disable one of them since the other cybers would have had to have their components in their heads removed. Selena screams in pain as Pamela tells her to hold still as she continues to work, finally prying the bullet out of her shoulder. She begins stitching up Selena who knows they should have have left the bar sooner but again Pamela's ideals clouded her mind. Dee Dee says that she needs to recalibrate her circuits so she's going to hit the hay thinking she actually needs to sleep in a barn. Pamela tells her that it's only a figure of speech as she gives Selena a sleeping elixir that will help her heal. Selena immediately falls asleep and the next day is awoken by a plant dog which she shoes away as in the barn Dee Dee also awakens finding a bloody shovel nearby. Selena comes to see her as Pamela cheerfully joins the duo, saying that she's hungover and they are all wanted women. Dee Dee is shocked to find that she's wanted as a woman as well, learning of the bounty that is on their heads which makes Dee Dee excited since now they have to hide out for a day or two, meaning it is now a girl's weekend. Selena reminds Pamela that she has obligations but Pamela knows that they need to lie low unless she wants another hole in her and as Dee Dee reminds them, their girl's night was cut short so she still is owed some fun. Selena wonders what they'll exactly do around the farm so Ivy treats them to a spa day. During their relaxation time, Selena notes Dee Dee appears to be coming apart on the face. The droid reveals that she picks at her face since she's been thinking about taking the component out of her head that contains everything from her consciousness to human memories. Pamela is shocked to learn that she has human memories, discovering Dax implanted some memories of a dying teenage girl inside of her. Memories Dee Dee has that make her long to be in touch with people she doesn't even know. The women are shocked Dee Dee is thinking about ending it all, so the women change talk to Bruce Wayne and Selena's relationship. Ivy says that they've been together for a couple of times but Selena turns it around on the woman saying it's the exact same with Harley Quinn as well. Ivy says it's complicated and that she's better with causes than with people which is why she's been coming to the hideout to get away from others. Dee Dee agrees with Pamela knowing that people are difficult to be around as Selena says that all this girl talk is giving her a rash so Pamela goes to make them some drinks. As she bartends she hears something thinking that it was just Rover playing in the forest but it's some of the Magistrate's men who quickly surround the women in the hot tub. Ivy calls for Rover and the plant dog attacks, eating the men whole. She knows that there will be others coming and they need to leave, so as they gear up, Selena realizes that there were no animals in the barn thanks to Rover eating them all and Ivy buries the remains, which explains the shovel with blood Dee Dee found. Dee Dee wants to know if it's animal or human blood, but Ivy will only confirm that it is blood. Selena thinks that Dee Dee tips someone off, not trusting the droid still. She's suggests that they find a place to call the resistance and turn her over as the magistrates drones and trucks arrive. The cybers open fire on the women as they head towards the dead end. The cybers follow in after them but cannot detect the women as they are ambushed by the women from the trees, taking one down as Dee Dee confronts the other, hacking into it and disabling it as Dax arrives, telling Dee Dee to come with him. Dee Dee says that she guessed this is goodbye as she rips open her face, removing her mind component. Ivy says that she only has five minutes left 
life to live now, and Selena wants her to keep it in so they can all escape together, but Dee Dee says that she's never felt more alive than over the last weekend. But there is one thing left she wants to do. Dee Dee grabs Dax with her arm trendles, wanting the world to learn how he made a companion out of a rough prototype droid and a dying teenage girl's mind, and then left her confused and undone. Dax orders his men to fire, so the cybers blow Dee Dee apart, killing her. Dax is saddened his pet is dead, looking for the chip which Selena has, and thanks to having the chip, the cybers will not fire on them, allowing Catwoman and Poison Ivy to escape unharmed. One month later, Pamela contacts Selena, telling her Dilton's worth has plummeted and the magistrate dumped him, possibly even dumping him in a river since no one has seen him since he was charged. Selena says that the component got her the credit she needed to help the strays, saying that she needs to actually leave to help the kids, promising to see Pamela at the grand opening. Pamela takes off her coat, growing some vines up the side of the building and promising that she'll have a shrub waiting for Selena at the bar. Selena says that running a speakeasy is a big turn for Ivy as the woman climbs her vine up to her new club, saying it's time she stopped hiding from others, which is ironic since now she owns a place that gives others a hideout. Selena knows that Slam would be proud, but Ivy knows Dee Dee would be as well, seeing as that she renamed the club in honour of the woman.